Jesus' name we pray. Everybody ready? Is everybody excited to about Gideon? Has anyone ever heard of Gideon before? He's kind of one of those guys that maybe all oh, you know, the girls seem to. Probably if I had to come up here, you would tell us all about Gideon and who he was. No, but you've heard of his name. Okay. Well, in the Bible, we have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and then Judges. So what's going on here? Well, we had Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt. I'm going to start there, assuming you know how we got to that point. And then Joshua continued to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. And then after Joshua, there were a series of different, you would have different prophets, or they would call them judges, that would kind of rise up in leadership during that time. This is before they asked for a king, before King David came along. And actually, it was King Saul before King David. So this is the time after Moses has helped them get to the promised land. Joshua has helped them get into the promised land. And they still have some enemies out there. And so Gideon is just an average guy trying to make his, his daily living, right? And they had some bad guys, the Midianites. 
and they were very oppressive. And so it says the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in the mountain cliff, huts, caves, and strongholds. And whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, the Amicoites, and the Eastern people invaded the country. And they camped on the land and ruined all the crops all the way to Gaza. Did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It is impossible to pump them with their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Now, if you're an Israelite, you'd be like, wait a minute here. You brought us out of Egypt where we were slaves, and you brought us into a land, and you had leaders get us here that said, this is going to be the promised land. We plant these crops, we have all this livestock and cattle, and then these bad guys come in, and they kill everything, and they ruin all of our crops. This, to me, does not seem like the promised land. I don't know about you, but that would not be what you promised. God, you promised, right? Prosperity and hope and a place where I can have my kids out and be playing in the streets, right? And instead, we have to go hide in the caves. And so the people began to cry out to God for help. Now, it would be really awesome if God always just kind of showed up, you know, and like just, just like kind of like in those movies that you've ever seen, like where Zeus shows up. He's got this big white people, you know. Oh, and guys die, and that's the end of it. But God doesn't show up like that in our lives. You don't see that throughout the Bible. Usually what he'll do is he'll raise up a leader, and this leader will come around and will hear from God and will tell everybody what he heard God say, and then somehow there will be an action. Okay, so this is what's got to happen here. I mean, come on, there's got to be some sort of relief. They're in the promised land. So you would think that God would look around and say, who is the one guy that's the strongest and the most intelligent and the one that's been saying, pick me, Lord, I want to leave the children of Israel just like Moses did. But that's not what God did. He didn't. He didn't find somebody that was all excited and wanted to leave. Instead, he picked Gideon. <laughs> so that's where we're going to start. Okay. So Gideon is here. It says, the angel of the Lord came out and sat down under the oak in Ophrah, and with that belonged to Josiah the Ezraite, where his son Gideon was threshing the wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. All right, so God is going to come down and talk to Gideon, who is threshing his wheat in a wine press. Now, for all of us that are not farmers, we're like, what does that have to do with anything in the story, Mary? Why did you underline that part? <laughs> well, the reason why I underline that part is because Gideon has come out of the cave and he has grabbed some of his crops and to make the wheat into something that they could actually eat to be able to take back up to the caves and feed people, you have to thresh it. What does that mean? It means like you get the plant and the little seeds are in there and you gotta like beat it and you gotta get the chaff out of it and you gotta get the little seeds to fall out of the plant so that all you have left is the grain. I mean, we, we kind of get that, right? I mean, when you go to the when you go to the um, Jack's Fruit Market there, the stalks that the corn grew on are not there. It's the corn itself, right? Unless you're buying that decorative stuff. For the kid. But he's got to get the, the grain off of the stalks. But he's not doing this out in the open in the fields where they normally do it or in his barn or anywhere else. But he's going down into a wine press. A wine press is a pit. So they would have these little pits where they would put all the grapes in it. They would stomp around on it. You all seen the I Love Lucy episode, right? Where she was stomping around on the grapes, right? So he's down in a pit hiding, watching out for the enemy. So here the guy is. He knows the enemy is out there, but he's willing to go and do something. And he's hiding out in this place. So he's got a fearful guy here. He's somebody who's willing to go and get the crop. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he says, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now Gideon's probably thinking, a mighty warrior? I'm not out here with my sword ready to fight the Midianites. I'm hiding down in a pit trying to get food for my family. But yet God saw Gideon and said, You're a mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened to us? Where are all these wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did the Lord God not bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and has given our land into the hand of the Midianites. I will just 
Not only is Gideon a scaredy cat down in the pit, but he is a questioning scaredy cat down in the pit. Who is like when the, the, the angel of the Lord is standing there and saying, you're a mighty warrior. He's like, down, he's not saying, oh, me? Oh, wow, thank you. What do you have for me to do, Lord? I'll be your servant. No, he said, you're the God? You're the, you're the angel of the Lord? Well, I got some questions for him. Now, why do I keep bringing this up? Why do I want to tell you about the story of Gideon? I want us to ask ourselves, who am I in this story? Am I like Gideon? Do I know there's enemies out there, but yet I still got to go through every day and do my work, even though I got to be kind of scared and I got to get down in that pit, afraid that the enemy's going to come, right? Have you ever lived your life like that where the shoe's going to drop? Like, when is the next shoe going to drop, right? When is the next bad thing going to happen? Right? I've been there, I've been there, done that. I don't know about you. And I've questioned the Lord. Like, God, you gave us this building. Why am I down here pulling the leaves out of the gutters? Right? I'm just, can I be real? I might not ever be real. If you guys can't handle my realness, I probably still wouldn't be here. But, right? Have we ever not questioned God? Have we not said, God, where are the mighty works that I've heard you do? And yet, here I am struggling today. Isn't that amazing? It's like, you think about, like, my son Matthew. He's, he's, Matthew waved to everybody. Okay, so Matthew was a pound and a half when he was born. The doctors at the hospital called him Miracle Matthew. He was born at 27 weeks. So, now, he could be like Gideon. He could be at 21 saying, God, where are these miracles that I heard about when I was a baby? You, you made sure that I lived, but yet here I am going through life like this. And then you think you feel this shame and guilt. Satan puts it on us. Oh, you're questioning God. Oh, God can't use you if you question. That's not really heavy faith, is it? Oh, you're down in the you're down in the pit, hiding away from the enemy. I mean, when you think of a mighty warrior, you think of somebody going out there and attacking the enemy, right? You think of somebody confronting the enemy. And he is saying, You're a mighty warrior because he's willing to at least come down and get the food. All right, let's keep going. I need a lot more here. He says, he says, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength that you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Now, Gideon just said, God, really. He questioned him, he questioned him, he questioned him. And God just said, yep, I'm going to have you save him this time. Uh, pardon me, my Lord. Pardon me, my Lord. Isn't that funny? Like, I wonder how that would translate to nowadays. I mean, what would it be like? Really? Like, what the? You know, like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, I, I mean, I wonder if that part of me was like kind of, you know, risque back then to say to the, to the angel of the Lord, pardon me, my Lord, when you replied, but how can I save you? Or save Israel? Getting a reply. My plan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. I love that. This guy knew his weaknesses, but yet God still used him. Makes me wonder what's my excuse, right? When I say, um, hello, Lord, look at me. I'm, I'm, I'm married. I'm divorced. I'm a woman. How are you going to use me? I mean, that's just being real, right? I mean, if you go by today's standards, like every little, you can't be a pastor unless you've got this degree from this seminary. And you, you've got this holy, perfect life, right? And yet Gideon said, really, me, I'm going to help save? I'm the weakest. I have no name. It was all status back then. The Lord answered him, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. See, God didn't care about his excuses. God continued forward, even though he questioned and he questioned and he questioned. And he gave all his reasons why he wouldn't do it. The Lord said, nope, I'll be with you. You're going to do this. And now Gideon gets smart and he says, yeah, this is, this, I'm going to die in a wine press, right? Maybe a few from the past wine have made me drunk, right? Am I, am I really hearing the Lord correctly? He says, all right, give me a sign. If I have found favor in your eyes, you will give me a sign. So now as we continue reading through these next couple chapters, what you find out is he... He goes to the Lord and he says, okay, give me a sign. And so he did something basic back then. He took some fleece off of the sheep and he, and he put it down. And he did this twice. 
One of the times he said, okay, and when I get up in the morning, let there be dew everywhere, but let your squeeze be dry. And so when he woke up the next morning, he went out there and yep, the ground was all wet, but the fleece was dry. Then the next time he did it, he said, all right, this time let the ground all be dry, but let the fleece be wet. And so he went out the next morning, he squeezed out the fleece, and sure enough, all this water came out of the fleece. Now, I find it so interesting that they document this. This is showing you the character of Gideon. This is not only a person that was scared and was doing his work, though, he's really doing his work, but he was down in a pit. And he questioned God, and he told him all of his weaknesses and the reasons why he couldn't do it. But then he also said, hey, I'm not even going to consider doing this unless I know it's in you. God will show me a sign of something that I find unbelievable. And God did. Sometimes we're afraid to ask God, like, are you sure? Is it, is it wrong to question God? Do I not really have any faith? But Gideon asked for that, and God showed him how to do that, how, how, how he was really doing that. So finally, it was time. So he says, okay, hey, everybody, God has said it's time for us to rise up and go kill these bad guys. We're not going to let them take our land anymore. We're not going to let them take our crops anymore. We're not going to let them kill our sheep anymore. And so just the fact that somebody was willing to do this, over 10,000 guys showed up. Woohoo! I mean, he didn't think he was a leader. He didn't think he was of the right status, but he's the first guy willing to bring them all together, and 10,000 guys showed up. Now, if I was Gideon and 10,000 people showed up, I'd be pretty, I'd be not happy when 100 people show up. Could you imagine 10,000 people showing up? Like you're saying, like, hey, we're going to go do something. 10,000 people showed up, and you're like, yes. All right, God, do you see this? All these people came, now we're going to go defeat the enemy. And God said, no, 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 no. I told you that you were going to do this under my power. Yeah. I gave you that sign, remember? Yeah. You had too many guys. What do you mean? Gideon's like, really? Like, you told me to do this. I'm doing this. I called for the men to help. That was 10,000 guys. should be telling you it's too many. And God tells him, if you do this with 10,000 men, Israel will not say that I showed up and helped you. Israel will say that by our might and by our power and by their 10,000 men, we defeated the enemy. He says, you've got too many. He says, I want you to go out there and ask them, whoever's scared, I want you to go home. Okay? So, we see it here in Judges chapter 7. Early in the morning, Gideon and all of his men camped at the spring of Herod, the camp of the Midianites, the north of them, in the valley of the hill. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver the Midianites into your hand, or Israel will boast against me. My own strength can save me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave. So I was actually wrong here with the numbers. So 22,000 men left, while 10,000 remained. So that means that they originally didn't have 10,000 guys show up. They had 32,000 guys show up. And now they're down to 10,000. So again, I still think 10,000 is a lot of guys. I'd be like happy with that. I'd be like, okay, well, I had 32,000, but now I've got 10,000. But at least I'm not going against the enemy by myself. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Really? Like, really, God? That's too many men? Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out for you there. If I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord said to him, Separate those who lap the water with their tongues, as dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. So it doesn't really make sense. What is he saying? He says, 300 of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs, and all the rest got on their knees to drink. So he's saying, look, some of them went to the river's edge, and they were aware that there's still an enemy. So they just reached down, cupped their hand, and brought the water up to their face. So they still stayed up and led it to battle. Whereas all the rest got down, put their, 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 their weapons down, got down on their knees, just put their face in the water, and didn't really pay attention to what was going on. Only 300 had the foresight to stay upright and bring the water to them. And those 300, God said they could stay. All right. Now, it says that the Lord said to Gideon, those 300 men that left it up with their hand, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. 
So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and the trumpets of the others. So we have, we went from one guy scared in the pit to one guy scared in the pit with God to one guy scared in the pit questioning God to one guy scared in the pit who questions God who asks God to give him a sign to one that calls for help and 32,000 guys showed up to asking all of those who are scared to go home and being left with 10,000 and then out of those 10,000, finding out who would really be alert at all times and being down to 300 guys. Now this is where I want us to stop for a minute because I hope you assume that this story does end in victory and it's a really cool victory. I'll tell you all in a minute. But let's stop for a minute and ask ourselves, who are we in this story? And it's okay to be any of these people because at the end I'm going to tell you where we go from here. Maybe... You're not the Gideon. Maybe you were one of the ones up in the caves, hoping that Gideon would come back with some food and share it with your family as well. Maybe you were one of the 22,000 that when you were asked, hey, you're scared. You don't want to go into battle, go home. Maybe that was you. Sometimes you just need to be honest with yourself and say, I'm at a point where I know there's an enemy and I'm scared. And if I'm just asked, do you want to help? No, I don't want to help. Okay, you can go home. Okay, I'm going to go home. Because here's the thing. At the end of this battle that we're about to hear about, when God delivered them, all of the Israelites benefited from what 300 men did. Why? Because they didn't stop being part of the Jewish family just because they were scared. See, sometimes we forget that even though I'm not the one here setting up the stage, I got to benefit from that worship. Why? Because that's part of this church family. And that's okay. We don't need 50 people setting up a stage. I mean, it'd be nice to have at least five, right? Strong guys here helping set up the stage, but we don't need 50. And we all benefit from that, right? And I know this isn't a battle. There are no enemies here coming to stop us from putting up the stage. But my point is, it's okay to say, I'm at the point where I'm still just scared, and if I was asked to go home, I would go home. But now, there were also, in that 10,000, 9,700 of them that said, hey, I, I, I'm not too scared. I'm going to go into battle with you. I want to be with you guys. I want to be part of this. But I have no thought that the enemy might injure me when I'm with my brothers, and we're all going down for a drink before we go into battle. I'm not thinking, I'm not always on guard. I'll show up when you tell me to show up, but when I'm just kind of hanging out, I'm not looking for the enemy. I'm not looking for the devil under the rug. And you know, it's okay if that's you, if you're not aware that there is a constant battle going on around you. That even when you're with your fellow man, that, that you have to be on guard. That sometimes that the enemy can crop up even when you're amongst Christian fellows, brothers and sisters, right? Because guess what? Those 9,700 guys, they still benefited from the battle that the 300 went into battle. So now you're probably thinking, okay, you got Gideon, you got 300 guys, and these are guys that even when they're among their fellow man kind, right, and they're going down to drink, if they're like, they're just bringing the water up to their head and they got their hand on the sword and they're still waiting, like, these guys must be warriors, right? I'm assuming that's why God would want the guys that were alert, even going down for water, that they would be amazing warriors. And that he said, okay, I want you 300 to get a sword in one hand and a dagger in the other. We're going to go slaughter the enemy. That's not what happened. You would think so. I mean, it'd be really cool. I mean, I think like, the, what is it, the Spartans? They had like 300 of them or something. And they held off the... I don't know, there's some movies like that. You can watch the, you can read the history of the, of the Spartans. That's why the uh, Michigan State came the Spartans, because they were warriors and they held off the enemy at his pass. But Gideon's guys were not renowned after all this happened as these amazing warrior guys, because God was like, even though these 300 are really awesome guys, and you're alert even in amongst 
safe people. You know that there's an enemy and you're alert. He was like, I'm going to have to do something different. That way we know that it was only I that did this battle. And if you continue on with the story, Gideon again begins to question God. And God says to him the night before the battle, and he says, look, if you're still scared, if you still are wondering, he's like, go down there by yourself and listen to what they have to say in camp. So he went down and he heard one of them talking about a dream and he found out how these guys were really scared of the Israelites. And it made his heart strong to know, oh my gosh, these guys are scared of us. This is a sign from God again. So he went back to these guys and he said, okay God, how do you want us to fight this battle? And he said, I want you to give everybody a torch. Okay. And he says, I want you to light, have a light torch and put a jar over it so it blocks the light. Okay. So they all get a torch that's burning. So they put a jar over it. And now they get a sword in the other hand, right? And say, no, 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 give them all a trumpet. A trumpet, I mean, seriously, right? Like, God and his trumpets. Like, my son, Wesley, is a trumpet player, and I'm like, he doesn't know how secretly I'm excited that he's a trumpet player. He says, you know, how did Joshua and them defeat Jericho? They marched around, they played the trumpet. They marched around, they played the trumpet. In the end, they blew the trumpet, and they all yelled, and the walls of Jericho came down. Trumpets are really cool. God always uses trumpets. He says, in one hand, you have them have a trumpet, and in the other hand, have a torch that is covered by a jar. And he says, I want them to go into the camp in the middle of the night when everybody's sleeping. And when you guys sound the alarm, everybody is going to blow the trumpet, and they're going to smash the jar, and they're going to wake up, and they're going to see that there is 300 guys standing in their camp with lights, and they're blowing trumpets. And that's all I want them to do. I just want them to stand there with the light in one hand and the trumpet in the other, and that's all I want them to do. Now, that would be really hard. I don't know about you, but I like talk about like wanting to go bear hunting, and I think, like, can I keep a big knife in my back pocket? Like, can I have a handgun? Like, what if a bear gets, mauls me, right? Like, I'm too scared to think that I could go out there and just have a, a rifle to shoot the bear once and I'd be okay. Like, I, I'm afraid, right? Like, I'm thinking, like, I, I want some hand to hand combat of skills available to me if a bear gets on top of me. So could you imagine going into the middle of a camp with all of the enemy and not having a knife, not having a sword, not having anything but a trumpet and a torch? But that would require you to have faith that God is going to fight this battle. And that all you can do is praise the Lord through that trumpet and let your life shine. Well, Gideon and these guys, they went and did it. And guess what happened? The Midianites, they woke up and they were so disoriented from the trumpet sounding and from the people holding torches that they began fighting each other and they all killed each other and all the Midianites died. Those 300 guys were standing there holding their trumpets, holding the light. And so then all of Israel knew that God fought that battle for them. That no Israelite actually had to like fight back. They blew that trumpet and they held up the light. So now you're probably sitting here thinking like, okay, Mary, you just told us this whole story, and I get it. Yep, sometimes I'm scared. Yep, sometimes I just want to go home. Yep, sometimes, like, uh, I say, yeah, I'm willing, but then I'm not really aware of the enemy coming against me. What does that have to do with today? Because there's no Midianites coming after us, right? I mean, this, this kind of would make sense if we had, like, Russians at the Canadian border ready to move to Michigan, maybe, right? We've got a lot of Russians on our company still. But the reality is we do have enemies today. They're just different than the Midianites. And it is Satan who is our enemy. John 10, 10, Jesus talks about this. He says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give you life and life to the fullest. It, it's, Paul actually does a really good job here in Ephesians talking about this. He's trying to encourage the people. Let's read it. This is Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, after all this message, everything I told you, this is the most important part. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, 
and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Are we like those 300 that brought the water up as we were looking around saying, yes, I see it. Yes, I see it. Do you see greed trying to steal your joy? Do you see anger or lust or addiction coming against you and your spouse or you and your family? Or do you battle against flesh and blood? Do you see your loved one as your enemy? Do you see your in-laws as, as your enemy? Do you see your boss as your enemy? Do you see the president as your enemy? Do you see the governor as your enemy? Do you see the police or the neighbors down the street as your enemy? Because I promise you, your enemy is not in flesh and blood. Just in case you forgot who your enemy is. Um, it says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers. Now, when he said rulers, authorities, and powers, he didn't mean the governor and the president. He says, the rulers, the powers, the authorities of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Yes, folks. I'm talking about Satan and demons. Yeah, I know. Feels like one of those um, horror movies, right? Where the dark lords come out of whatever planet that is. I think it's to tell me. Right? I mean, the movies do it just justice, right? We, we flock to see all this stuff. We flock to see the, um, what is it, the vampire killers and the werewolves and all this stuff. Our fantasy, our movies, we, we go and we see and we know that there's evil out there. But then yet when I talk to people and I say, do you believe in demons? They'll say, oh no. I'll be like, really? Do you believe in God? Oh yeah. Do you believe there's devil? Well, I don't want people to think about the devil and his demons. So I just say no, because I don't want to think about them. But that'd be kind of like me saying, I don't want to think about paying my taxes. And after a few years, you know, okay. And then all of a sudden, bam, all my accounts are frozen, right? They're garnishing my wages. They're coming, I mean, I can deny the fact that I want to pay my taxes all I want, but the effects of that are still going to come after me. We can deny that we really have an enemy, and his name is not Fred, right? Instead, it is something more sinister. See, the battlefield really is in our minds a lot of times. It really is in this, in the, in this heavenly realm. Have you ever walked down a dark alley and just felt evil? Sometimes it's a store, sometimes it's a place, sometimes it's a bar, sometimes it's somebody's house. You know, when you walk in someplace, when you're in a situation, and all of a sudden, something in the atmosphere shifts, something changes. Have you ever gone to somebody's house, and most of the time you go there, and they're happy, and everything's good, and then sometimes you walk in and you tell it's me. You maybe find out later that somebody has been fighting. Because, see, Satan sends his little minions and his demons to go and to fight us. And just like the Midianites said, oh, our animals have been slaughtered, our, our crops have been destroyed. Satan will come in and he will try to destroy your relationships. He will try to destroy your day, your week, your peace, your joy. God was very clear when he said that. If the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give you life and life to the full. So here's the thing. Jesus says there's an enemy and he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give you life and life to the full. Okay, Jesus came. We know we can accept Jesus as a person and Savior. We know that we can... Um, plead the blood of Jesus over us and we're forgiven of our sins and that when we die we're going to heaven. But how in the world does that translate into the spiritual battle? Well, one of the things that Jesus told his disciples continuously was that I must go so I can send you the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit can be with you. Now, the disciples were scared after he died on the cross. They thought that they were going to be next, that they were going to be killed. At one point when he came, um, he died and then he rose again during those 40 days and he would come to visit him. One of the times he said they were in a locked room and he appeared. 
Why is that important to know? Because they were so scared, they were locking the door behind them. They didn't want people to come in and know that they were talking about Jesus. But what's interesting is after the Holy Spirit fell on them on the day of Pentecost, they went out in the streets and began to preach. Nothing governmentally had changed. They still could have been put on a cross, and many of them were throughout the next few years, killed because of their professing Christ, but they were no longer afraid because the Holy Spirit had come over them. So how does that translate for us today? I'm telling you that Jesus said that the Holy Spirit was given to us to be able to help us, that we can use the name of Jesus. It's interesting because when we blow the trumpet in Zion, we proclaim who we are with, what side we're on. When we make that known, we can use the name of Jesus. So there's literally been times where I've become really angry about something, and I have to say, in the name of Jesus, Lord, help me. Right? You have to use that name of Jesus. Many people have to let your light shine, right? What is the light? And so what is the water and the word and all these different things that are given to us to get the words? We've got, obviously, we come to services. We let our light shine through our works. And then we have to rely on that Holy Spirit to be with us and call on God to help us. So let's read, finish this here in Ephesians. Because it tells us how we can stand firm. It says, therefore, put on the full armor of God, so when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Oh, he's saying, you know, sometimes just to stand through the storm is going to be a lot. But a lot of times people fall, right? The houses fall. Jesus says that, you know, one man builds his house on the sand, and when the storms come, the house falls down. But the other man builds his house on the rock, and the storms still come on his house. But at the end of the storm, his house is still standing. He says, the rock is my word, the word of Jesus. He says, when you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up your shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Did you know that the evil one is shooting flaming arrows at you? You ever felt them? Oh, I have them hit me. I have them take me out. And there's been times where I've had an arrow hit me, and I just totally lost it and fall out. And I'm like, the next day, I'm like, what was wrong with me? Satan tried to tempt me, Satan tried to get me offended, and I took the bait. Now I gotta go clean up that mess. Now I gotta go apologize. Now I gotta go repent. Now I gotta, man, you know, a lot of times it's going away. We do that too, you know. Or we stay wounded for a really long time. But what we need to be able to do is have that shield of faith up, right? Have that truth of belt, belt of truth around us. Oh, when Satan whispers in your ear and says, oh, so-and-so hates you. Well, they wouldn't have said it that way. Is that the truth? Right? In the midst of that struggle, in the midst of that fight, maybe it sounds like the truth, it feels like the truth. Your feelings lie to you. Don't go by what you're feeling. Go by what's the truth. What is the truth? What is the press, breastplate of righteousness in place? When Satan says, oh, you're not righteous, and then try to hit her emotions, her feelings, say, no, I'm not, but I found the breastplate of Jesus' righteousness, and I put that on me. In the end, the disciples had to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Fleshly men as they were, they were scared. The men that were with Gideon, they were scared. They were honest. Some of them were more honest than others. Some of them were not scared. They were willing, but they were not aware. I don't know about you, but I want to be like the disciples were after the Holy Spirit fell on them. I want to be courageous, and I want to be aware. I want to be aware that there's an enemy, but courageous enough to do the right thing. And to fight that enemy. So that means that when my kids are struggling, and I want to just yell and just be controlling and just make them do whatever, I need to stop and I need to pray and be like, Lord, the spirit that is on them, this, this negative evil spirit in the name of Jesus, I break it off. Sometimes that means excusing yourself from the situation. Say, excuse me, you go to the bathroom and take a minute to pray. 
because you are aware that the people you're talking to are not your enemy. The people you're talking to are being attacked with flaming arrows from an enemy. Being aware means that when I'm having a bad day, I stop and say, hey, what is wounding me right now? What is true? What, where do I need to have some faith? Where do I need to bring up the shield? Where do I need to call upon the Holy Spirit to help me? Where do I need to use the name of Jesus? And I know that this seems super simple, and you guys are like, oh, Mary, taking five minutes to pray at work is not going to help me when I'm struggling. You have no idea what my day is like. You're right, I don't know how to know what your day is like, but I know God. He knows what your day is like. And I am telling you that saying a prayer in the middle of your day is the one thing that is going to help you through that day. I'm honest to God telling the truth. I've had professionals tell me that they were, had been in meetings and somebody starts and it just it was just like horrible and they literally in their head said a quick prayer like, Lord, get this person out of the meeting and the person's teeter went off within five seconds and they had to leave the meeting for the rest of the day. I had other people tell me that they were just so behind at work and they just went into their office and they said a quick prayer and within 30 minutes, supernaturally, they got all caught up for the whole day and were on track for the rest of the day. Now you're saying, well, why didn't God do this every day? Well, every day I need a bad day. In the morning I say, God, help me with my day. Why didn't he help me that day? Because guess what? Satan is going to come in and try to steal your crops. And the question is, is how are you going to call upon the one who can fight that battle for you? Because I promise you, the battle is not against flesh and blood. The battle is a spiritual battle. And I'll be the first to admit that I've engaged in a spiritual battle for far too long, and then all of a sudden I snap to it. The Lord slaps me upside the head, and I'm just like, Lord, I repent. Forgive me for fighting this. I ask you to fight this battle. I ask you to come in here. I plead the blood of Jesus over this situation. And I see situations turn around. And then I'll be honest with you, there's been times where I prayed, and it felt like in the flesh, God didn't do a darn thing. And that was the moment that I had to have faith and say, I don't get it, Lord. Just like the Gideon, the guys that follow Gideon, when all of a sudden they said, okay, I'm going to help. There's 30, 32,000 of us. Yeah. All right, we're scared to go home. Mm, half the guys are going home. More than half the guys are going, I'm so brave. I'm going to do this. All right, go get a drink. And all of a sudden, there's 300 of them left standing and looking at each other going, what in the world happened? You're going to, I can't bring my sword. Are you sure, Gideon? Because, like, this is my grandpa's sword. I've played it all these years. I got the sword. I want to use it. No, I get a trumpet and I get a torch. It doesn't make sense. I've had days like that where you pray and you're like, God, this doesn't make sense. Because sometimes God... It's not looking at that moment. He's looking at the long term. If God cared about the moment, he would have let 32,000 of them go and just wipe out the Midianites. But he was looking at the long term. What are the children of Israel going to remember? What, 3,000 years later? 4,000 years later? Is it? We're going to remember that God defeated all of them by them having a trumpet and a torch. There have been times where God doesn't answer our prayer in that moment. But yet, we still pray, we still ask him to fight that spiritual battle. And sometimes it's years later, sometimes it's months later, sometimes it's weeks later, we realize like, oh, I'm so glad that turned out that way. I am so glad. And sometimes we'll never know. I've been on car rides before with my children, and I pray, Lord, help us get to our destination safe and sound, no problems. And I've gotten a flat tire. And I'm on the side of the road saying, really, God? But I don't know one day in heaven when God will say, I gave you a flat tire there so you avoided an accident there. I have to have faith and know that I asked him to fight that battle that day. And that day he delayed me with that flat tire. And that's okay. So for us today, knowing that there's demons out there, it's kind of be scary. Let's be real especially if we feel like we don't have any power to stop a demon. In newsflash, you don't. But the name of Jesus does. So I want us to pray 
that when we are aware that a fiery arrow is coming from the enemy, which is in the heavenly realms, the evil enemy from the heavenly realms is attacking us, that we will pray and that we will use the name of Jesus to tell him to stop. And that we will have the courage that the disciples did after the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So all of you that are willing to pray and to acknowledge that yes, there is evil in the world, and yes, sometimes it attacks our minds and our thoughts and our situations and our relationships. And if you believe that your enemy is not just your loved ones or your in-laws or your bosses or the people on the street, but that it's in satanic realms, right? I want you to stand up with me and I'm gonna pray that the Holy Spirit will give you that wisdom to know what to say and what to do and how to use the name of Jesus. So if you want me to pray for you, that you will have the courage of Gideon and have the Holy Spirit to help you, please stand up and let's pray. Father God, we are here and we have heard your word that just like you were with Gideon and you helped the Israelites defeat the Midianites, that you will help us, Father God, defeat the satanic forces that come against us every single day. And sometimes it's just a battle in our mind. It's Satan throwing arrows at us, telling us that we don't have the reason to live anymore, or that people don't like us, or that uh, we can't say no to things, or that we don't know what we're doing. Whatever the demonic voices are saying to us, we just stop them right now in the name of Jesus. We just rebuke all demonic voices from speaking to us and for affecting our relationships and our jobs in the name of Jesus. We ask you, Father God, to fill us with your Holy Spirit. I ask you to baptize these people right now in the name of Jesus. Let your Holy Spirit fall upon this parking lot, upon every single person that is here, every single person that is standing, that is acknowledging that Jesus, you are Lord, and that the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit is stronger than Satan that wants to try to harm us. We receive your courage. We receive your awareness. We ask you, Father God, to help us to receive the benefits from being part of a church family that is praying for us and praying for our job situations and our family life and our government and our community. But we also receive, Father God, the insight that you personally give each and every single one of us. Delay us when we need to be delayed. Give us prosperity and favor when we need prosperity and favor. And give us peace, Father God. But also make us aware when Satan tries to enter our thoughts or our home, that we can pause, even if it's just in our mind, and say, in the name of Jesus, Satan, you must leave us. And you, Father God, will show up. You will fight our battle. You will send the Holy Spirit to be with us and to guide us. You will send your holy, mighty warrior angels.